Hey, what's up, everybody? This is Gary with the Get Some Podcast. And my guest this week is... <laughs> this motherfucking Gary. <laughs> Hey, what's up, everybody? This is uh, Gary Owen with the Get Some Podcast. Uh, this week, I am in Austin, Texas at the Cap City Comedy Club. That's uh, July 5th through the 7th. <clears throat> and then uh, July 12th through the 13th, I'm in Buffalo, New York. Well, I'm really in Niagara Falls. I'm at a um, casino out there. Was it the, the, the Lion's Den? I, I Hold on. I, I sh- this is embarrassing. I should know where I'm at. Uh, I want to give it the right. I think it's Bears Den. Oh yeah, Bears Den. Yeah. Uh, what casino is it in? It's in the Seneca Niagara Resort and Casino. It's called the Bears Den. It's a little showroom theater they got inside there. But that's going to be July twelfth and thirteenth, and then um. Uh, let me see. July 27th, I'm in Las Vegas <coughs> at the Pearl Theater inside the Palms. July 28th, I'm at the Keswick uh, Theater. Uh, in, it's in um, Glenside, Pennsylvania. I guess it's right outside of Philadelphia. And then uh, just announced uh, July 9th, I'm in Tucson, Arizona at the Rialto Theater. And I'm going to be in Jackson, Mississippi. Uh, I'm sorry. I said July, August, August 9th, I'm in Tucson, Arizona at the Rialto Theater. August 11th, I'm in Jackson, Mississippi. Um, And then Tacoma, Washington, August 16th through the 18th at Nate Jackson's Super Funny Comedy Club. And we just got Nate on my New Year's Eve show in Dallas. Uh, So we got Lavelle, we got Nate, and we're working on a couple other people before we get the flyer out and get it out there. So, uh, August 23rd to 25th, I'm in Hartford, Connecticut at the Funny Bone. And then I'm in Hawaii. September. I, I, I haven't really pumped Hawaii because I had two offers and one uh, promoter didn't send the deposit. So, Hawaii is on uh, September 6th and 7th at the Blue Note. We got four shows. And, uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to Hawaii, boy. It's funny, like, I got these buddies that uh, live in Hawaii. They're called, they're called the Weiner Brothers. Uh, both single. Both. One's in his late 40s. One's in his early 50s. Uh, when I say live in life, I live like vicariously through them. I can't live the life they live. Like, they go hard. Like, I went to Italy a couple years ago, and I called them on like a week's notice, and they met me in the Amalfi Coast. Who does that? Well, I called him and I said, hey, I think I'm going to go to Italy. And then I just, you know, you you just tell people I think I want to go somewhere. And then a week later, a a week out before I leave, they called me back. They go, are you still going to Italy next week? I was like, yeah. They go, all right, we're going to meet you out there. What? (laughs) Then they met me out there. We just, we had a ball. In fact, we're going to go to Greece um, soon. I don't want to give the dates out, but we're, we're going to Greece. So if anybody's going to be in Greece at some point in July, uh yeah, look for us. We're gonna do two days in Athens, three days in Mykonos, and three days in Santorini. So I've never been to Greece. Uh, but I want to go with them because they've traveled the entire world and and they got loot. So it's not like we're going on a budget. So I, I like I told them for this this Greece trip, I said, look, you guys book it and then just tell me how much. Because I know you're gonna stay in nice hotels, and I know whatever so we're, we're you know i they we got online and they told me where we're staying and i just i just venmo them the money and i said all right uh we'll just yeah we're gonna have a ball like if we if 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 greece can compete with italy yeah it's gonna be an amazing trip italy when i went to italy that exceeded all my expectations the food was as good as i thought it was gonna be the cities were as beautiful as I thought they was going to be. The Amalfi Coast was everything I thought it was going to be. Uh, 
I don't know. I I don't, I think that's probably one of the best trips I've ever been on was Italy. It's going to be tough to beat it. And when I went to Italy, I went I did the south thing. I flew into Florence and then spent 2 days in Florence, went down the Amalfi coast for 3 days and then spent the last 2 days in Rome. And actually Rome was my least favorite of of it, Rome was still great, but it was my least favorite of all the cities. And now I've heard Athens is really a big city like it's kind of dirty. There's uh, there's parts that are dirty. There's graffiti. I'll, I'll let you know once I go. But I heard Mykonos and Santorini is is everything you see on the internet. Uh, so I'm excited, man. Those Weiner brothers, man. I tell you what, they if you if you ever go to Hawaii and you go to Waikiki, go to the Mai Tai Bar inside the Royal Hawaiian. Tell any of the bartenders there, you're with the Weiner brothers. And they're going to be like, okay. They're going to make your drinks extra strong. You're going to get better service. Them boys run that Mai Tai bar at the Royal Hawaiian in Waikiki. And they got it down to a science. Because when I went there about a year and a half ago, and when I was there, the way they drink, they always say they're going to stop, but they don't. But then what they do the next morning, they get up, they get in the cold tub where they live. has It's, it's a got it's, 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 it's some plush building in in Waikiki, but it's got its own like private, uh, almost like a, a men's spa inside of it. But they get up and they get in the cold tub first thing, and then they get in the sauna, and it knocks out all the liquor, and they're ready to go all over again. I I got to day three with them boys. I said I can't keep up. I I don't know how you do this. I can't. I'm ready. I'm ready to go home. I want to go home. I literally told him, I said, I can't, I can't drink no more. I need to go home. <laughs> but we're going to do it again. We're going to do it all over again in, in September. Uh, I'm probably going to come out a couple days early, stay a couple days, and, and we're going to go hard in the paint like we always do. Uh, yeah. So September 6th, September 7th, I'll be in Hawaii going hard with the Weiner Brothers. Uh, and and we're going to be running, we're going to be running through Greece too. Uh, this summer. So yeah, it's going to be a good, uh, good, good couple months. Uh, so with that, um, couple things that, that I saw in the news this week, LeBron James, some Bronny James got drafted by the Lakers in the second round. And I, I've heard both sides of it. Some people were cool with it. Some wasn't, I just put like this nepotism is never going to die. Uh, of course, he got drafted because LeBron's on the team. And there's nothing wrong with it. He's not, I mean, he's not like a, a scrub. I mean, he can play. But it's just like, of course. And it's probably okay. First father-son duo. Um, and, I, you know, it would only be someone like LeBron that could get something like that done. Uh, but who's not going to want to see him go to a game and, and, and see him ball out? And that's just what we... This whole country is really based on them. To the hell, we had two presidents. We had George Bush, and then his son was a president 20 years later. How many times have you seen an Italian restaurant, speaking of Italy again, that's got family owned since 1854? You see a, pl you know, you'll see a plumber's van drive by, and it'll be like Johnson and Sons. Uh, hell, my, my team, the Cincinnati Bengals, it was uh, Mike Brown. It was it was Paul Brown, then it went down to Mike Brown, and now his daughter's basically running it. I mean, that's there's a there's a great steakhouse in Cincinnati called Jeff Ruby's, and his daughter Brittany, like she's she's in the family business now. I mean, that's just what it is. My my son opened up for me, uh, in in Oakland years ago. I mean, you, as a parent, that's what you do if you have the family business. And listen, the the James family business is basketball. Uh, so if he can get him on the team, it's going to generate ticket sales. It's going to generate revenue for TV. Of course, people want to see that. And uh, yeah, I I'm excited. I'm excited for it. Uh, I don't think nothing's wrong with it. Um, I think it was the worst kept secret in basketball. But uh, yeah, if you if you got a if you got a problem with it, then uh, Maybe you should do better in your own life, you know?
It's so funny. Like some people get so upset and emotionally involved, like it's really messing up their life. And I'm going, it's, it's just fun. It's entertainment, you know. Uh, and it's LeBron. Come on now, <laughs> LeBron. Whatever LeBron wants, LeBron's gonna get. Uh, as far as the Lakers, so yeah, he deserves it. It's gonna be fun. It's gonna be fun to watch. Uh, on another sports note. I was watching uh, the UFC fights this weekend. There was a uh, whether you whether you're a UFC fan or not. There were two. There were two like storylines uh, in this week's in in this um, weekend's fights. That was pretty. Hold on, that was pretty. Um, I just thought of something. I don't want to forget it. Put it in my notes. Uh, they were pretty interesting. There was a there was a fight between this guy named Diego Lopez and Brian Ortega, and Diego Lopez, if you don't know, he's an up and coming fighter, and Brian Ortega is one of the best fighters in his weight class, and <clears throat> it got like two days before the fight, and they said, look, Brian's not gonna be able to make weight. He just he's already he was supposed to fight like at one fifty five. He was bulking up. He got offered this fight. He took it. He was trying to cut. He's not going to make it. So they 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 figured out like a catch weight for them to fight at. And the fact that Diego Lopez said, yeah, 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 I'll do it, which which is big. That's a fighter's mentality. Uh, and then <laughs> the morning of the fight, Brian Ortega got sick. And they was like, I guess the UFC went to Diego Lopez and said, look, you don't have to fight. We're still going to pay you or we're going to try to find somebody real quick. And they found this guy off the street. Uh, he's a UFC fighter. Let me let me give credit where credit is due. Uh, there's nothing worse, as, as I hate people call me Owens with an S, than mispronouncing somebody's name. So I don't want to mispronounce this, game, this guy's name, especially after what he did uh, this weekend. Oh, what? Well, okay, I was going to say. Uh, where's it at? Oh, there it is. Okay. Dan Ige. D-A-N, last name is I-G-E. This dude was sitting on the couch, and they called him the day of the fight and said, you want to fight? And he said, yeah. So he woke up that morning and just was like, mm -hmm. he was getting ready for another fight in a couple weeks, but they call him and said, you want to fight? And he takes it. And the fact that Diego Lopez took the fight and he didn't have to, he could have got a free payday and, and they fought. I was like, that's some, that's some like legendary shit right there. It's like a, it's like a comedian being at the house and them going, Netflix calling going, you want to shoot your special tonight? What? Better hope you got your set together. Uh, I mean, that's the equivalent. If I can relate it to stand-up. It's literally like being at your house and them saying, hey, man, we got the cameras. We got an audience. We got everything here. The, the comedian that was supposed to film a special got sick. Can you come film this special? Uh, that's what it's like. And the fact that they fought, and it was a good fight. Diego Lopez versus Dan Ige. I mean... Shouts out to both those guys and just the backstory behind it. The fact that Diego didn't have to fight and would have still got paid and had already been through so much. Like, was supposed to fight at one weight. So you're, listen, I don't know how those guys cut weight like that. To me, that's harder than fighting. You, see, you really watch UFC and boxers when they weigh in, they look so sick and unhealthy. And then some of them bulk up like 20, 30 pounds in one day. That's how dehydrated. That's how much they're starving themselves to make weight. And the fact that Diego Lopez was already starving himself trying to make weight and then got the phone call, uh, yeah, it's going to be at a higher weight. Okay. And then got the phone call, yeah, the guy you're supposed to fight that you've been training for, he's not fighting. We got a new guy. And the new guy the night before woke up thinking – I'm going to watch UFC 303. Now he's in it. Co-main event. Man, shouts out to both those guys. For real. 
Uh, and then in the the main event, Alex Pereira was fighting this guy, Jiri Prohaska. And Alex Pereira is like, I, I don't know, he's, he's like an X-Men. He's made out of a lab. He's just strong. I, w I watched, they, they got this thing on YouTube called UFC Emb Embed It. And if you, if you get a chance to watch it, I would watch it. Uh, it. It's just like all the episodes are like 10 minutes long. And all it does, whenever there's a, 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 a whenever there's a, a UFC 303 or UFC 304 or whatever, a big, one of the big UFC events, they follow all the fighters the week of. And it just shows them preparing, training, cutting weight, uh, where they're living. You, you, it's basically you're peeling back the curtain. You can see what a fighter's going through the week of. It's pretty interesting, and it's in 10 minutes. It's real quick. But it's funny. Like, I notice every little thing when I watch these things. And one thing I noticed about Alex Pereira is they they showed him going out to eat, and he, he ate some tiramisu. And I go, he's eating dessert? <laughs> I was like, I thought that guy was eating, like, steak and vegetables and, like, bones. That's what I thought he was eating. And... The fact that he had a tiram tiramisu, I was like, what? That guy eats tiramisu. I should eat tiramisu. He's got a bunch of people eating tiramisu thinking they can fight like him. But uh, the backstory is so interesting. Alex Pereira won. He knocked him out. But the backstory about this is so interesting is um, uh, Izzy Adesanya, right? He was like one of the pound for pound. He's one of the best UFC fighters right now. And about four or five years ago when he won the belt and he was on top of it, he kept bringing up Alex. Well, Alex Pereira kept making little comments on social media because back in their kickboxing days, they fought two times and Pereira beat Izzy by decision. And it was controversial. And I've rewatched the fights. Uh, uh, I don't know. You can watch everything on YouTube now. I rewatched the first kickboxing match between Pereira and Izzy. And I think Izzy won. I don't, you know, I don't even think, think. I know he won, but the decision went to Alex. And Alex looked shocked when he won. Second fight, kickbox, and they fight again. Izzy is dominating. Almost knocks him out of the first round. Completely dominate the fight. And Alex catches him with, like, the one hit or quitter and knocks Izzy out. And so when Izzy became champion and was just annihilating everybody in the UFC, all of a sudden, this video on YouTube pops up of him getting knocked out. And it got like 15, 20 million views. Something ridiculous. And so everyone's like, oh, Izzy isn't invincible. And then Izzy, is he does an interview and he said, yeah, there's some, there's always going to be some guy at the bar in Brazil saying, I, I beat that guy. I beat that guy. Well, Alex Pereira was in Brazil at a bar when he heard this and was like, oh. And it lit a fire under him. And then he started training, put the liquor down, some Rocky type shit. And then, then he, st he starts fighting again. Dana White gets wind of him. He starts winning and knocking people out, brings him into the UFC, and he starts annihilating people in the UFC, fights Izzy, and for four rounds, Izzy completely dominated him, stunned him, wrestled him to death. And then in the fifth round, in between the fourth and fifth round, Alex Perez corner said, you got to knock him out. You're going to lose. You got to knock him out. He knocked him out. He knocked Izzy out. And I do think it was an early stoppage. I think Izzy could have kept going. I think when you're the champ, you got to be knocked out, not like halfway out. You got to be knocked out. So I think it was an early stoppage. But still, Alex knocks him out, becomes a champ. They rematch. Izzy knocks Alex out. Now, at this point, when Izzy knocked Alex out, they were looking at Alex Pereira like he was invincible. Couldn't couldn't be hurt, nothing. And Izzy knocks him out cold. And I was like, and it looked like Alex was about to knock Izzy out when that happened. So, which brings us, Alex couldn't drop the weight anymore. So, he got, I got to move up. So, now he moves up to light heavyweight. And he's just been annihilating people at light heavyweight. And he knocks out Jerry... Year Prohaska for the second time, and it, it, this was brutal. Uh, and so it's just like this is like a, it's almost like a Rocky story in Brazil. 
and just the backstory going on. And, and oh man, it's, it's some exciting stuff right now. Whether you like fighting or not, look, just Google Alex Pereira and just look at his look at his life story. Uh, man, I, I saw this whole thing on him on YouTube where he was in Brazil and <laughs> didn't didn't have nothing, so he started working at a tire shop. So he's working with grown men, and you know, grown men after they get off work, they go have drinks. So Alex is like a 14, 15 year old kid drinking like a grown man with grown men, and then it takes off and boom, goes from there. I'm like, what a story! What a story! So. Enough sports for now. Uh, I, unless you've been living on a rock, I guess you saw Rick Ross got sucker punched. Got well, not sucker. But it was a it was a fight in Vancouver. Uh, at um, and I don't know some Drake fans uh, jumped to Rick Ross and his crew, and somebody in Rick Ross's crew got knocked out. And then I don't know the next day, Rick was on his private jet, acting like it wasn't a big deal. Let's go get some Wingstop. He's an investor in Wingstop. His, his crew was like laughing about it all. Drake trolls it. He likes one of the videos of Rick getting sucker punched and his boy getting knocked out. And then <laughs> Drake's like saying happy Canada today. And then Marlon Wayans chimed in and says, look, I was with Biggie the day he died. I saw Tupac the day he died. We can't let this get to the violence. Uh, it's fine with the the beefs and everything, but we can't let this get to the violent level. And I'm more like, I've never been that big of a fan of an artist that I want to fight somebody that they're beefing with. I'm like, I, I've never been that emotionally invested in anybody. I'm just, I, I saw it and I saw it escalate and I saw the guy sucker punch Rick Ross. And then... <laughs> It really looked like nobody really wanted anything to go down. And then when it went down, went down, I'm, I'm just glad there wasn't any guns or knives put out with straight fists. But, man, it, people, people don't realize security for any of these artists, they are not there to fight. They are there to ensure the safety of the artist. So for those of you saying they ran, that's what they're supposed to do. That's what they're, they're – listen, there's too much money involved. I ain't fight nobody in Vancouver, Canada, because uh, they like Drake, and I'm beefing with Drake. That, I'm, that, that's the security's job. So, in essence, Rick Ross's security did their job. Uh, you ain't, you're not there. I, I did a joke on one of my specials where I said I got people all the time hit me up saying you need security, and I'm like, no, because I I leave when situations happen. I'm out quick. I'm not even. Ha if I'm Rick Ross, I'm not even having the back and forth with the guy over the disrespect and whatever. But it's funny was, shoot, last week I'm talking about Kendrick Lamar and Drake. Now we're talking about Rick Ross and Drake. I'm like, Drake's in the middle of a lot of stuff right now. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, for those of you that don't know, security's job isn't to fight. It's to get you out of there and show your safety. Let's, we got, I said in my special, I said, I don't need, I don't even know if you can fight. I need your 40 time because you got to beat me to the car when shit hits the fan. So I hope this were, is, is where it ends. I've been to Vancouver. I'm like, oh man, did I, oh, I did see a fight in Vancouver one time, but yeah, I don't, I never think of Canadians as being like angry, uh, I don't know. I just I think I always think Can Canadians are nice. <laughs> so to have, to have this happen in Canada was kind of shocking. I was like, oh, I thought Canadians would be like, hey, Rick, let's talk. All right, it's okay. We know it's just rat beef. It's not a big deal. But please don't don't disrespect our country. Okay, we like you here. So clearly, somebody likes Rick Ross. They booked him, and he and he and he made some money, and the the show looked packed. So somebody likes Rick Ross in Canada, but. All right, enough on that. Hopefully, it, that's, this is where it ends. We don't hear nothing about it, and hopefully, Drake and Rick Ross can collaborate again because uh, they did have they they've had some banger songs when they collaborate together. So, you know, we need to have like a rap summit and just say, hey, can we just all just hang out? You know, so let me just indulge in my own career real quick. Uh, 
I said, you know, a couple months ago, I filmed, I filmed a special. I went to San Jose. I filmed the special on Friday, and we're we're we titled the special "Broken Family." It's very divorce heavy. Uh, a lot of betrayal from friends and family in my life is what I'm really talking about. So it's I don't want people to think I'm going off on my ex. That's not what this the core of this special is about. But I'm really proud of it. Uh, Bill Burr's company, All Things Comedy, saw it, got behind it, and was shopping it with us, and and currently are still shopping it with us. Uh, but the the frustrating part is, so I filmed this special Friday. And Saturday I woke up and I, I, I was talking to my manager. We were talking about it. I said, yo, are we clean? Because we did two shows Friday night. We were going to do, we were doing two shows Saturday, but uh, we were going to, I was supposed to do the same set. I've been working on the same set for like two years to, to really make it solid. So when she said, yeah, we got it. We don't, you know, tonight's like, um, it's house money. I said, I'm going to do a different hour. So I shot a different hour on saturday so i basically got two special for the price of one and i self-financed it and uh so we've been out there shopping it and the frustrating part is we've only shopped broken family the first hour we haven't even shopped the second hour we always thought the second hour would just probably go to youtube uh because I've, I've seen how ali sadiq and a lot of comedians i i, I said ali because i think he's maximized and benefited the most from YouTube out of comedians that I've seen. Like he's just dropped special after special on YouTube. Uh, so I, you know, I'm actually, I'm going to call Ali this week to talk to him about, um, just pick his brain on um, things he would do or not do, uh, with, with YouTube. And that, that's why I always think it's good to be cool with all the comics because we're, it's a pretty generous community. Uh, when you're getting along with people, we're, we're quick to share knowledge with each other and help each other out as much as we can. I mean, hell, I got Bill Burr's company behind Broken Family, but the frustrating part right now is Amazon passed and then Netflix had it, has had it for at least a month and we just, we don't hear anything. And so um, now one of the powers of B is is on, I think he's on maternity leave. And so now we got to wait another couple weeks. So now I'm like, does we, do we just put a fork in Netflix and Hulu's going through a transition right now? They're, they're, they're flipping their whole comedy department. So I don't think they're buying anything currently like that. So yeah, I'm in kind of a limbo with my special. And sometimes I wish, I wish like, I guess Netflix does that to an extent because you see these specials that Kevin Hart produces or Dave Chappelle produces and they get on. But I thought when, when Bill Burr's company got behind it and they have a, they have a deal at Netflix and they brought in, I thought, Oh, we, there's a good chance this should go, but it's not looking good right now. I'll put it like that. I, I would be, I would honestly, I'd be surprised if Netflix bought it. And I really hope they do because I feel like that's, that's like the, that's our, our UFC. That's our NFL. That's our major league baseball NBA right now. There's obviously other good leagues out there, but for comedians, I think Netflix right now is the, is the spot. Now, granted you got Peacock. I've seen people have special HBO max. I've had a lot of specials on Showtime, but um, Showtime's not doing specials right now. So, when we shot the special, we were like, okay, the big three, we'll call it, was Amazon, Netflix, and Hulu. And Amazon passed. That left us down to Hulu and Netflix. Hulu is like in a transition period over there at the network. So they're not buying right now. So it left us with, leaves us with Netflix right now. And I just thought, man, with Bill Burr's company behind it, and uh, they already got their deal set, so there's no negotiating. It's like, yo, this is what the money's going to be, and we just got to find a release date. And it and, and it's good. It's really good. I'm really happy with it. So it's just, this one might be going to YouTube. So it's like, I don't get, I don't get mad. 
I don't get bitter, but I do I do get frustrated a little bit. But it's also it's still exciting though to think I uh I still can release it on YouTube. So that's why I say right now is a beautiful time to be a comedian. Because if I would have did this 15 years ago, I would have just been out. I would, all the money I spent on my special would be like, I did that with uh, the first special I ever did, Breaking Out the Park. I uh, I did it and didn't sell it anywhere, but I, I boxed it and sold it in DVDs. That's when everybody was buying DVDs. So I, I sold on the road for years. And then, uh, and then I ended up getting a couple TV deals out of it. It was all, almost like my calling card to, to writers, directors, studios. So in essence, I did make my money in a roundabout way off my first special breaking out the park. Uh, but it never aired anywhere like that. Uh, you can see clips on YouTube and stuff, but it's, um, it's a really good special, but it's, I look back at it now and I'm just so young and my topics and everything. I'm like, Oh, I was, I was all over the place on that one. But this one, this one I was like, I was really proud. I, I, I am proud of it. But it's exciting because it's not hopeless. I'm like, man, nobody will buy it. I spent all this money, and now nobody's going to see it. Nah, people are going to see it. Uh, but now I got to look into, I got to like step back, refocus, get with my manager, and we just got to, we got a game plan of different and how we can get it out. So the most eyeballs will see it because the reason you do specials is to sell more tickets on the road. That's why we do comedy specials. And so you're just, the goal is to have as many people see it as possible. And if that, that could be a YouTube route. I look at someone like Nate Jackson, uh, who has completely built his fan base. He's similar to Matt Reif. Where it was just social media driven and TikTok in particular. And then Matt Reif, I remember him doing the, was it crow funding, crowd funding, some, some kind of funding for a special. I saw him on social media talking about it and and then took, takes off on TikTok. Now Netflix has given him basically whatever he wants at this point. And honestly, he deserves it. He's selling tickets like that. When, when you're selling tickets on the road like that, it translates to eyeballs when your special does come out. And I think that's the thing that is frustrating with this. It's like I do have a good I – I have a loyal fan, ba fan base. I do have people that would tune in and watch, and, and I, think it would, I think it would do okay. I don't know if I'd break records. I don't know, but you never know. Lightning in a bottle. I see what – I see what Netflix did for Deion Cole who was a comic that was grinding and we all the comics knew Dion Cole was funny. He had his own little style, his own little way of things. And once he got that Netflix special, and I knew when he got it too, he filmed it in Charlotte. I go, he going to be on his way. I knew it. And now, now Dion's doing his own tours. He's out there s selling way more tickets. He did a second Netflix special. And so I was like, so for me, when I see someone like a Dion Cole like that, I'm like, you know, I'm like, oh, I just almost feel like I just need that shot. And I'm not sitting here saying, give it to me. I'll go shoot it myself. I'll put my money where my mouth is. And that's what I did. So that's what um, that's what's frustrating. But at the same time, it's not hopeless. It's like now you just go, OK, let's revamp and we're going to get it out there. Somehow, hell, the worst case is you just clip the hell out of it and you put it on TikTok, Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, everywhere. And then hopefully people are like, where can I find it? There's, you know, you got different, you got Moment and Patreon. You got all these different, these pay sites you can go to too. So it's, yeah, I'm frustrated. I'm disappointed, but I'm also excited because whether, whether it happens at Netflix or not, Hulu or not, somebody new at Amazon comes along and says we want it, uh, or we just put on YouTube. Once I have the release date and I can promote it on all my socials and 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 and, and get behind it, you know, I'm uh, the one good, not one good thing, but the good thing about 
YouTube is like, you can see how many people have seen it. You can watch it. Same thing with, with TikTok and Instagram. And all that. You can actually see how many people watched it and how many people shared it, what the engagement was. So in that aspect, it's exciting. So uh, we're, we're going we're gonna to see what happens. We're going to see what happens. But, yeah, I was a little, I was a little like, whoa. I really thought when we got all things comedy behind it, I thought, oh, yeah, because they, their deal set at Netflix. So there's no negotiating. It's just like Netflix paid this company to bring them specials. And when they bring the specials in, they're like, okay, we've already – pre-negotiate the deal you were just we just need the special and they gave it to them and there's i guess they're just and i guess the frustrating part is you don't know if they're watching it you don't know like i don't even know if amazon really watched it i don't really know if netflix really watched it or are they just looking at the name on it uh i don't know and you know and i would never be one to ask like like when i saw dave produce lunels and earthquakes i was like I'm almost got, I'm so happy for him because I love new Lunell. I love earthquake and watching them as long as I have, I'm like, I put myself in their shoes. I'm like, it's gotta be such a good feeling to grind and grind and you get a special. And the fact that another comedian put his name to it and was like, yeah, this guy deserves it. I see Kev do it with, uh, Keith Robinson, um, recently. And I was like, yeah, that, that guy, look, I guess they have a, they have a real backstory when Kev first started in stand up and was, was going to New York and open mic. And I guess Keith was a guy that really looked out for Kev in the beginning. So to see Kev now look out for him years later, I'm like, I, I'm looking at that. Like, that's just dope. That's just awesome. You know? And I would, would I, would I love for that to happen for, for one of these specials? Yeah. But I'm not gonna ask uh i think there's so many comedians that have that have, we all help each other along the way um guy tory helped me tremendously early in my career put me on stage when i first got to la and nobody was really knew who i was and guy tory was the first one to put me up at fat tuesdays and he just did it off somebody else's recommendation how i slept on guy's couch when he was shooting the movie ride uh he you know i was living in his house i was just sleeping on the couch because I was trying to get my name out there in LA. So yeah, guys, one that really looked out for me. So there's, I mean, that's just, it's just our business. So we're going we're gonna to cross our fingers and we're going to hope that Netflix comes around. Uh, you know, if it happens, great. If not, Hey, I'm just going to revamp it and we're going to figure out how we get it out there. But yeah, I was, I was, it was funny cause I was talking to Nate Jackson because I really wanted him on my New Year's Eve show in Dallas this year. And he's a smart dude. And he was telling me how he started clipping his 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 videos up. And now he just took off. Now he's doing theaters on his own. And he was saying, you know, I don't have uh, – he doesn't have any specials out there. He doesn't have uh, Netflix, Amazon, Hulu, anything. So he's literally built his fan base completely off social media – off stand-up clips and in particular crowd work is a specialty so in that aspect yeah specials aren't what they used to be where it was like if you got an hbo special you were you were off and running immediately now it's not like that it's not oversaturated there's just a lot of options and uh but then you look at Dion cole who Dion was peppering people with being on blackish old spice and stuff like that but i think it was his Netflix specials that really took him from boom. People was like, oh, wait a minute. This dude's funny for real. We're going to go see him live. Uh, even the, the the young guy that I don't want to say take under my wing, but the mailman that I had on my podcast a few weeks ago and stuff. He's out there selling a decent amount of tickets. Uh, and it's all from social media driven. It's not it's not from stand up. It's more of his his character and, and, the, and the things he's saying and on social media. So there's a lot of different outlets. There's no like. We're not like lawyers where you got to go to college, got to get an undergrad, got to go to law school, got to pass a bar exam, and then you get uh, you get hired by a law, law firm. This stand-up, there's so many different directions you could be going, you know, 
So we'll see what happens in the future. We're going to cross our fingers. Uh, oh, I didn't even shout out Miami last week. I was in Miami last week, and we had such a good time. I ain't going to lie. I was worried about Miami because I get, I get my ticket counts for clubs and theaters every Monday and Thursday. And it's usually for the next two months I'll get ticket, how many tickets I've sold in every market. Miami was a little slow, and I was getting worried. Man, them shows were so packed. And I look, I talked to the manager when I settled Sunday, and I was like, I was like, yo, man, I was worried, man. I saw them numbers. I was like, what's going on? He goes, we tell people, don't look at the pre-sales for Miami. This It's the week of. They buy the tickets, and in particular, the weekend of. And I was like, oh. Like, I expect something like that in Vegas or um, some of these, t- you know. Well, I would say Vegas. Pretty much Vegas. I expect that in Vegas because people are coming to town that weekend. They they, they look for something to do or they plan the trip. Like, what can we do when we get there? Uh, so, something like Vegas, I expect that. But not Miami. And I was talking I was talking to my opener, Rob. And we was, uh, we was talking about girls. And we was like, we was saying, we was saying like, where's the, where's the prettiest women at? And I think Miami has the prettiest Spanish women. Miami's got beautiful women everywhere. There are there's so many beautiful women in Miami. We know that. But my, I think Spanish in particular, and in particular, it's like Dominican, Cuban, Caribbean, Spanish women in Miami. I'm just talking about the United States. They're the that's the best city. White girls, I think Nashville. Nashville has the prettiest white girls. Black girls, I say Houston, by far. Uh, you always got your your LAs, um, uh, Miami, where you're going to see just so many beautiful women of of every culture, every race, and stuff. But if you're looking at like overall, and what I've seen in my life, Nashville had the prettiest white girls. Uh, Miami has the prettiest Spanish girls. Houston has the prettiest black girls. You know I like my black girls, so I know. <laughs> I'm a black girl connoisseur. Yeah, stallions. Stallions in H-Town. I'll put it like that. <laughs> I know. I got twins by one. <laughs> uh, and then I, I will say Phoenix, too. Phoenix has a lot of pretty women overall, too. You see a lot of pretty women running run off Phoenix. So, uh, yeah, we were just talking about that. I, and you know what? I, I'd like to just see what you guys think. So I say Miami Spanish, Nashville White, Houston Black. Those are my top. Those are where I say the, the, the three are. Asian, ooh, I didn't even bring up Asia. I would, mm, I don't know. I don't know. I'll let you guys tell me about Asia. I'm, I'm, huh. Hey, probably, I would probably say, and this may sound crazy, San Diego. San Diego has a lot of pretty Asian women. Uh, being in the Navy there, Filipino, uh, Japanese, Chinese, Korean. Yeah, I think I think San Diego has the prettiest Asian women. Uh, so, yeah, so we're going to say San Diego for Asian, Nashville white, Spanish Miami, black Houston. That's my list. So you guys tell me yours. Who's got the prettiest women? Let's just recap. <laughs> Spanish Miami, white Nashville, San Diego Asian, Houston black. And I'm talking every shade of black. Light skin, dark skin, thick, donkeys. Yeah, Houston. People are, people are sleeping on Houston now. A lot of people probably gonna, thought I was going to say Atlanta. Uh-uh. Atlanta's great. Don't get it twisted. But Houston. Yeah, Houston's got it. I think people got people really got wind of Houston when COVID hit. Because Texas stayed open. So I think a lot of people used to take girls trips, uh, guys weekends and stuff when you didn't want to, when you didn't have the money to like really get out, get out of the country and stuff like that. A lot of people used to go to Atlanta. I think now uh, Houston was open. So COVID hit, people started hitting Houston. They're like, oh, Houston's different. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it is. It's like that. Trust. All right, y'all. This weekend I'm in Austin, Texas. And uh, I'm at Cap City. And don't forget Vegas, July 27th at the Palms Theater. And then next week, um, Buffalo. Buffalo, well, it's it's Niagara Falls. But it's the uh, Seneca Casino, uh, Bears Den. 
All right, y'all. This is Garen. We'll see you next week with the Get Some Podcast.